Now, what I want to talk about tonight is something that has not really been dealt with all this week. We've talked about the Feast of Unity, uh, the Feast of Joy in, in great particulars, but the Feast of Rest we have not touched on. And the Lord has put on my heart tonight to share with you the Feast of Rest. And it was a dealing I've had since um, about 1961, so I can't share all that <laughs> in one evening, so I have to just kind of touch some highlights and uh, hopefully give you a vision of the Feast of Rest. And I'll have to take you back to where I was in the beginning of the early 60s. I was a missionary in the northern part of Canada, way up in the far north. Had an Eskimo girl living with us. It was a very primitive life. We just had an old farmhouse we lived in, no um, electricity or no running water. Everything was very primitive. And I had um, two children of my own to care for and five children belonging to the other missionaries. And they took off to the States to have meetings. And I stayed there with the family and with the Indians. And I didn't know the Lord in a deep way at that time. I could use the gifts of the Spirit and prophecy and so on, but I didn't have a very close and intimate relationship with the Lord. I didn't know that much about his ways or his plan or his purpose. And so I was most surprised one day. I wasn't even praying at the time. I, I think I was walking across the kitchen floor. And all of a sudden, I was arrested because the Lord had risen up in my temple and was speaking to my heart. And I was almost blown away by what he said. He said, I covenant with you this day to bring you into my rest. Wow. 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 I thought, what on earth can that mean? I didn't have a foggy clue what he meant. And I was scared spitless at this word covenant because I thought, wow, who am I that the Lord should make a covenant with me? I'm, I'm a nobody. I thought he just made covenants with men like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all those mighty men that we read of in the Bible. I'm just a little housewife here working among these Indians here and looking after these children how come he could say that word that mighty word covenant to me and what is this about his rest i just was upset and i didn't know what to say and he repeated it to me three times i covenant with thee this day to bring you into my rest and finally i composed myself and i thought even though i don't understand this the lord deserves an answer i have to respond to what he said so this is what I said. I said, oh, Father, I thank you. I thank you for this. Even though I don't understand at all what you mean by this, I thank you for it, and I, I thank you that you're going to bring it to pass, whatever it is, that you'll do it. I thank you, and I believe that you will do it. And so that was that. And um, I, like Mary, hid this in my heart and waited to see what would happen. Well, actually, it didn't take too long for something to happen, a most surprising thing, because I didn't know what his rest was, and most of us have had to learn by the Holy Spirit what the rest of the Lord is. And so one day, perhaps several weeks after he spoke this to me, he gave us a practical lesson to understand very clearly what his rest was. He just pulled a number on us one Sunday morning. We lived about 16 miles from town. Uh, we were just in a little village living right among the Indians. And um, on Sunday mornings, we would drive into the town, and we'd have meetings at this little hall uh, with the Indian people. And there was one um, white family that came. So we were getting ready to go in this Sunday morning. We were getting ready to go in and have a meeting with the people. And we thought we'll stop in and have a time of prayer, as we usually did before we went to town. And when we started to pray, the Lord spoke to um, the lady missionary and said, um, I don't want you to go to town today. 
I want you to go out and weed the gardens. Weed the gardens? This is Sunday. I want to rest, Lord. I've been working hard weeding those gardens all week. We don't want to weed the gardens. We didn't have anybody supporting us at all. And so we grew big gardens in the summertime to help us with food. And it, we spent many hours sweating in the sun weeding those gardens. And for the Lord to say, don't go to church. Go out and weed the garden. That just seemed contradictory to everything that we knew. And besides, Lord, it's the Sabbath day. You know, we're not supposed to work on Sunday. You know that. You, you, you started this. You, you said it. It's your law. <laughs> you didn't pay attention to our arguments whatsoever. Go and weed the garden. All right. And we said to one another, well, do you understand what the Lord is doing? No. But uh, he reassured uh, the lady missionary that if we'd be obedient to him, he would teach us why he's saying these strange things. Okay. So we take our... Sunday meeting clothes off and put our old duds on and we go out and weed the gardens and we just wrote there long enough to get good and dusty and grimy and sweaty when um, this car pulls up in our driveway and it's that one white couple that came to our meetings and I'll have to confess this they were the only ones that could contribute any funds at all like dollars and cents to us because the Indian people, they would bring a fish or some moose meat or something like that. But dollars and cents, no, never. They didn't have it. But these white people had good jobs and, and they could help us out a bit. So we wanted to do everything kind of right to um, keep them happy, <laughs> to please them. That's human nature. <laughs> and so we thought, uh-oh, here they come. And this is who they were. They came and found us all dusty and grimy and working on the Sabbath day. So we quickly dusted ourselves off and went to the house and, and made some tea for them and sat them down and visited a bit. And they looked at us with these pointy eyes, you know, and as much as to say, um, uh, well, they wanted to know why we didn't come in. And we had no telephone. We couldn't phone and tell them we weren't coming. And, and they asked uh, why? What was the problem? Why we didn't come in? And they were saying as much as to say, you better make it good, because we don't like what we see. You out there working on the Sabbath when you should be worshiping and being in church. Now, wouldn't you say the Lord set us up? Oh, I tell you, did he ever set us up? And we felt so embarrassed. We thought, oh, Lord, what are you, what are you doing here? How are we going to explain this to these people? Well, we couldn't explain it. So the lady missionary said to them, she said, well, I tell you what, I feel the Lord would have us have a meeting tonight. So we'll come in tonight and you tell the others, we'll be in at 7 o'clock, we'll have a meeting, and we'll tell you then why we're working in the garden and why we didn't come to church this morning. And so, okay, and they have that look on their face, you better make it good, because we don't like all we see. <laughs> Oh, I tell you. So we began to seek the Lord diligently to tell us why he was having us do this strange thing. And the Lord spoke to this lady missionary, but she didn't tell us. She said, you're going to hear it at the meeting tonight when I speak. I thought, oh, in the meantime, I'm chewing my nails. I'm worried and I'm anxious. And what an offense we have been to the believers. And so when we got there and all the people assembled, these, this white family had um, a visitor with them, a young man. I don't even think he was a believer, just visiting them, and they brought him along to church. And so uh, my friend got up, and she explained what the Lord had uh, said to her about what he'd had us do. And so as clearly as I can, I will speak it to you. The Lord was teaching us about his rest, about his Sabbath. And before I say anything about that, I'm going to just uh, back up just a little bit and look back into the law. For 1,500 years, Israel faithfully kept the Sabbath. And if they did anything that was against the Sabbath, like if they would try to, to sell merchandise at the gate on the Sabbath day, well, oh, they'd chase them away. And, and they couldn't prepare any food or anything. They'd have to do it the day before and all this. Uh, that was a very important thing, that they keep the Sabbath holy, not to do any menial work on the Sabbath. Well, as time has gone by and we are in the age of grace, we're still keeping the Sabbath 
as far as coming together and worship the Lord, but as far as doing any work, it's pretty loose now, isn't it? Um, in my father's time, uh, he said, Sunday was always such a boring day. He said you couldn't go out and play ball or kick a can or, or anything because that, that was breaking the Sabbath. The men said they couldn't even buy a newspaper on Sunday to read. And my word, never mind uh, listening to the radio or something. It was very, very strict. And so why would the Lord do all that? He was having people very much aware that this Sabbath day means no sweat, no labor. It's my day. It's a day to be holy. And so for the Lord to tell us to go and work seemed to be an exact uh, opposite of what he was teaching through the Sabbath day. So what the Lord showed this sister was that he was bringing us now into the true Sabbath. And what we had observed for all this time since the law <laughs> was a shadow of the Sabbath. But he was going to teach us what the real Sabbath is. And the real Sabbath is not doing our own works. Ceasing from our own works to do the works of the Lord. Which doesn't mean anything necessarily with your hands, but to do the will of God. And I remember hearing this verse different times through the years and my people shall be willing in the day of my power. And that verse used to bug me a little bit because I think they've forgotten a word in there. Willing for what? Willing to do what? My people will be willing in the day of my power. What do you mean willing, Lord? Willing, there's something missing. But I have found <laughs> it was exactly a true word. There's nothing missing there. In the day of his power, we are going to be willing. Yes. Willing for what? Willing to give up our will and let him do his will. And so the Lord was saying, this is what my true Sabbath is. Whenever you do my will, you're walking in my Sabbath, whether it's Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Saturday. Well, no matter what day it is, it isn't a day anymore. It's a people doing the will of God, ceasing from their own works, from their own labors, from their own sweating, their own mind, their own carnality, their own will. Wow, I thought, my, this is wonderful. You mean it's okay to work on the Sabbath as long as the Lord tells you what to do? and says, I want you to do this, and then I'm in rest, and I'm not working even if I'm working. I'm not really working if the Lord says, I should do this. And I began to understand that the rest of God is a people, a people who are willing to let God be God and have his way and ceasing from our own ways. And from that point on, my brothers and my sisters, I entered into something that I can only describe as a fast from my own ways. A lady wrote to me recently, someone on our mailing list, and she said, Elaine, I really would like to fast for the Lord, but my health does not permit it. She said, do you know of anything else I could do, like instead of fasting? And I wrote back and I said, the best thing I could advise my sister is to fast from your own ways from your own thoughts. Now, I've heard different people say through even this camp meeting, and we've all had these struggles, that when you go to pray and you settle yourself down and you look to the Lord, man, all the thoughts arise from the day and from last week, and you're thinking about this and that and everything else. And where is the focusing on God? Because all of these other things, there's no rest in the mind. It's very, very busy, all the things you forgot, you're thinking about them. And if you can get a five minutes out of an hour for the Lord, you're doing quite well. And so the Lord showed me this, first of all, that we have to bring our mind, bring those imaginations that come into our mind, to bring them into captivity to the Spirit of the Lord. So this was probably the first clue I had that I must fast to my own ways. 
and that I must have, begin to have a rest and a peace in my mind. And so I began many years of a spiritual exercise that I call fasting to my own way. And uh, something would come up, and I would purposely say, I'm not going to make any decision on that. I don't want my own way. I want to know the will of the Lord. And so I maybe took this to the extreme sometimes, but that's okay. I was learning, and I needed to learn, and so I just gave it all I had. I remember one time, I will never forget, it was a lovely uh, time in the um, early fall in September, and it was, it was a Saturday, and Bill was home. He was teaching school at the time. He was home on Saturday, and he wanted to do something outside with me, go for a walk or enjoy the outside or something. And I was having to pray through on something. Some people were just living in a little bitty trailer, and we had an outside bathroom and this sort of thing, but we loved it. It was ours. And some people had said, we want you to live in our house, a nice three-bedroom house, and look after it for the winter because we are going to be away on the mining, mining field. We didn't know those people, and I didn't know if I wanted to live in their house. Bill said, sure sounds like the Lord to me. Inside bathroom, furnace, and everything. But you know, with a woman, it's different. We're nesters. No matter how humble the nest, no matter how little, it's yours. It's mine. <laughs> so we don't lightly hop out of the nest. And I didn't even know these people. The invitation came via somewhere else, someone else. If I met them, it might be different. So here I am wasting this beautiful Saturday afternoon. And Bill come every once in a while. Well, did you get through yet? No, no. And I kept telling the Lord, Lord, I, I don't want my own way in this. I just want your way. Whatever your will is in this, I, I'll do it. Four hours later, and the sun is going down, and our day is about shot, and I thought, oh dear. Four hours later, I get pretty desperate. I'm getting kind of dragged out by now, thinking I've wasted my whole Saturday praying. I finally said, Lord, I really mean it. I don't care. Whatever you want, it's fine with me. And would you know what he said? Elaine, he said, I just wanted to bless you. Ah. Oh. I just wanted to bless you. And he wanted us to have the house, but I had to be sure so I could leave my little nest. And so it was situations like that where I had fasted from my own way. I am not going to make a decision on this. I'm going to wait until I hear from my father. And it was in this manner I began to learn what his rest meant and begin to walk in it and to come into it. But I'll go back again because this is something cute. I have to tell you the response that night when the missionary shared this. I was rejoicing, and um, my husband was rejoicing, but and her husband was rejoicing, but and the Indians didn't understand, and these white people thought we were really off the wall. And they went home that night, and we heard from their young man who was visiting them that they had roast missionary for a midnight lunch when they got home. You know what roast missionary is like? They burned us. They thought we were really off the wall, and we never saw their faces ever after that. There goes our contributions. <laughs> Just like we thought, it's down the tube. But that was all right. And this young man said to someone, and this got back to us via the grapevine, and he was not religious. He said, you know, I thought that made a lot of sense what they said. That made a lot of sense. That you're in the rest if the Lord tells you to do something. You're not violating the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. If he says you should do something, you're honoring him and you're obeying him and you're doing it. But here it is. What will people think? <laughs> okay. Now just quickly I'm going to go to um, I don't know how much of this I'll share but we'll keep rattling on until I feel that's enough. At least I want to give you a few thoughts. Anyway, Hebrews 4 and verse um, 9. I mean, I'll maybe go back to verse 7. And he's saying this for you today. If you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, and I understand in the original this is actually Joshua 
when they first went up, if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Can you say that after me? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And this rest is going to be found in the Feast of Tabernacles, in the fullness. But you don't have to wait to get the fullness before you enter into the rest because he wants you to start working on that right now. Yes, he does. For he that has entered into his rest, what's happened to him? He also hath what? Ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Isn't that beautiful? Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, if this isn't a contradiction in terms, I don't know what it is. Labor is labor and rest is rest. But it says here, labor to enter into rest. Well, does that make a lick of sense? To labor to enter into rest? Well, I tell you, that Saturday afternoon I gave up because I wanted to seek the Lord until I knew his will about something. I was laboring to enter into rest. I refused to do my own way to do my own thing. And so I labored and I travailed in the spirit and, and waited before God. And you know what it, why it took four hours? It took four hours till I was willing <laughs> for the Lord to have his way, whatever it was. It took four hours to get my will subdued, to get all my objections underfoot, to get my will subdued. I labored to enter into rest. And I was so glad that the Lord said he just wanted to bless me. We had all kinds of company that winter, and they would not have been happy to go to the outdoor bathroom, etc. So I was very, very pleased that, uh, that the Lord had granted us that home. Okay. <laughs> so laboring to enter into his rest, the rest of the Lord is not just a day. It was a day. But now it is a people who will yield their own will and cease from their own ways and let the Lord rule. Okay? Let the Lord rule. Now some people in different denominations, they argue about, well, what is the right day? Is it the first day of the week, like Sunday, is that the Sabbath rest? Or is it the seventh day, is the Saturday the right one? Hey. You can keep any or all, doesn't matter to me. But basically, according to the scriptures in the Old Testament times, when did God rest? <laughs> the Lord rested on the seventh day. And on the sixth day he made man, right? Okay, and he rested on the seventh day. And so we know that the seventh day is truly the Lord's rest. And he's telling us something here. And we can see that um, man has walked now for six days. And there's a, a prophetic picture here in First Peter that gives us a guideline of what a day in the scriptures signifies. Possibly you know this, where Peter said, And a thousand years is as a day in the Lord. And with the Lord, a, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. We used to think, well, that means uh, time isn't anything to the Lord. It doesn't matter. A day is, well, is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. No, 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 no. That's a very prophetic. And the Lord is giving us a little guideline here when he's talking about one day. He's talking about a thousand years. But he's talking about two days. He's talking about two thousand years. And so he created man, and man has been, since Adam, we have been six days. We're at the end of the sixth day or the six thousand years and coming into the seventh day. Coming into the day of his rest. We're in that, that Passover time. I've heard prophecies since I've been here and words from others about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is the Sabbath day. And we're coming away from the day of man. The number of man is what? Six. Okay, we're at the end of the sixth day, and that's man's number. Man's day has come to the end. That's why everything is falling apart. In the religious world, in the economical world, just everything out there is falling apart because it is the end of man's day. Remember one time, not too long ago, I was in prayer, and the Lord began to impress upon me these words about 
the day of the Lord. And he emphasized it like this, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Like as if to say, it's my day and I'm going to have my way. But wow. I mean, you know, we say the day of the Lord is come and so on. But it's much mightier. We can't say that fast anymore. At least I can. It's the day of the Lord when he is going to arise and he's going to have his way. And that is why he's come unto us, unto a people, and said, Now, in order to come into this day of the Lord, you must come into my rest. And um, you don't have to be fully in that day to do so. You start right now, fasting from your own way, and say, Lord, I, I'm not going to do this unless I know. And at first, like I say, I'd have to pray a long time before I knew, just to get the cobwebs out and all the voices and all that. But I have uh, fasted long enough that uh, it's much uh, easier to hear the voice of the Lord. And I'm learning to go by the rise and the fall of the Spirit within. And I think to digress just a minute here because uh, it might be a blessing to you. In the Old Testament, the high priest had on a breastplate and all the stones of the tribe there. And inside the breastplate, there was like an envelope, like a pocket, you know. And in that pocket were kept these um, stones. We called them the Urim and the summon, or uh, lights and perfections. And whenever the high priest would want to inquire of the Lord concerning something, like if the enemy was at their gate, shall we go up and fight, or shall we make a treaty here, or what shall we do? He would take out the stones and look at them, and then make, uh, make the question to the Lord, inquire of the Lord, and if the Lord was in favor, if the answer was yes, the stones would light up. If the answer was no, the stones would remain dull. And so that was a type and shadow of what we have hidden away in here, in our pocket, <laughs> in our heart. We have the lights and perfections in there. It's called the Holy Spirit. And so when we ask the Lord something, or we hear somebody say something, perhaps our stones light up. Oh, yeah, we're excited. Or they just remain, what I say, blah. They stay blah. They don't light up. And if I feel blah,